Welcome to the Future of Life Institute podcast. My name is Gus Stocker. On this episode of the podcast, I talk with Connor Leahy. Connor is the CEO of Conjecture, which is an organization dedicated to scalable AI alignment. On this episode, we talk about AI safety, and Connor lays out his case for how AI could become dangerous to humanity. We then discuss two potential solutions to this problem, slowing down AI development and regulating it. And we talk about why these solutions might not be enough. Here is Connor Leahy. Great. Connor, thank you for coming on. Glad to be back. <laughs> what is AI safety? How do, you, how do you frame this problem? Because there are myriad, a myriad of, of different framings of the AI safety problem. There is a different terminology. What, what do you find most useful here? So over time, I've become more and more pragmatic in trying to like limit the scope of what we're talking about here, because yeah, if you think, do things too expansively, you know, it just brings a lot of baggage to people like to argue. I think if it just currently, uh, what, I, what I usually think about the AI control problem is kind of like, like what I call it, or the alignment problem, the sense that I want an AI system to do what I want it to do, whatever that means. And a even more pared down version of it is the problem of controlling a strong system using a weaker system. Where the weaker system in this context is a human. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> perhaps you could, you could talk about, uh, perhaps a good way to, to introduce the topic is to, is to think about how could AI go wrong, right? So what are some concrete scenarios? And I know there are probably a massive list in your head right now, but how could it go wrong? I mean, again, if someone asked me, Connor, could you please write down the top 10 ways I could kill a million people for under $10,000? I'd be like, well, I won't confirm or deny that I could do that, but if I could, I wouldn't do that. So there's a similar thing here where like, I can give you know, various scenarios of various concreteness, but like, I don't know if you've ever read this great post on Less Wrong. It's like uh, Tylenol and Terrorism or something it's called. Uh, it's a great post, highly recommend it. Uh, I think Davis Kingley wrote it. I'm I'm sorry if that was not the author. I don't remember. It's called like uh, Tylenol Terrorism and Dangerous Information. I think is what the post is called. And it, and it points to this. It's one of my favorite posts about info hazards. It points to this point where there is a I think in the 70s or 80s. I'm probably going to get some of the details wrong, but like the, the gist will be correct. There was a string of poisonings where an unknown person, non to this day, and don't know who did it, took open Tylenol bottles in. Um, shops and put poison into them and so several people died this was actually really bad so this was actually a truly terrible event and so obviously people freak the fuck out and like there is a bunch of like copycats as well copycats is another interesting topic that we don't have time to talk about but that's a whole other mimetic danger topic um and but the interesting thing here is is that that had never happened before like like pills of this kind have existed for a long time you know it's like bottles like they didn't have seals back then so for decades, they didn't have these like seals that they have now. Because you know, nowadays, when you open a bottle of pills, like this like seal that you have to like pull off, and you're not supposed to like if there's damage, you're like not supposed to take the pills. This is to a large degree why is it because of these poisoning attacks that happen. So there is this massive change in culture overall, and suddenly, and after the first person did it, there were dozens of attacks like these. There's all these copycats. There are dozens of attacks like these where people try to poison medication and stuff like this in random acts. Of and this was an extremely effective form of terrorism. Like, that, like, I mean, I genuinely, like, I think this is like super scary. Like, this is a super scary attack. So we don't, no one ever took credit for those attacks. We actually, which is also like very strange. Like, we still don't know what happened there. Um, but the interesting thing is, well, it happened once and then suddenly it kept happening. And like, you know, now that we have seals, it's like not well, much less of a problem, but it really seemed like just like one person came up with an idea and then it spread. And so this is a great example of an info hazard. The, one of the things that I've really learned as someone who has a bit of a security mindset, you know, I was a bit of a hacker as a kid, I was trying to you know, break things and like, you know, think how to get around things and whatever. How could I, you know, accomplish you know, silly things? How could I get around security systems? How could I you know, do things that maybe are not legal and so on? I never did, of course. Uh, I was a good kid. Of course, <laughs> never got into any trouble. But um, 
you realize at some point that like a lot of things that are obvious to maybe you or me are actually not obvious to a lot of other people and especially not bad people. Most bad people are like shockingly stupid, like truly genuinely shockingly unintelligent, especially like terrorists and like like, stuff like that are often just like shockingly uncreative and unintelligent and giving them ideas might seem like, well, you know, I've already come up with this. So, you know, like, you know, surely someone else, no one else can, but often they can. So I'm not going to get my most likely scenario because my most likely scenarios involve human actors doing stupid things. And like, I can think of a concrete human actors where I'm like, yep, that's, they would do that. They're definitely dumb enough to do that. But, you know, maybe it should not be named. But let me give you a, um, let me give you a, a, a slightly, a, a, the class, the general class of scenarios. So there are scenarios in my mind about like super intelligence and like takeoff and nanotech and like all that crazy stuff. But none of those are my main line. I truly think those are actually distractions from what I think like the, the minimum viable catastrophe looks like. For me, the minimum viable catastrophe looks much more like if you talk to people who work in like intelligence services or in like security or stuff like this, and you talk to them about how operations actually happen and like how to defend against things. So recently I was talking to a senior person in government and I'm going to give a concrete example because this is a fixed problem. So this is no longer, uh, they, they have solved this problem. So it's no longer unsafe. Um, this is like 10 years ago or like five or 10 years ago. And they were in like the office of the government, I'm not going to say which government or which person, but, uh, and they were talking to several like, you know, high ranking officials. I, I think like the head of state was there as well. And he looked at it, it as this big window, this massive, you know, open window. And he's like, what's stopping some teenager from flying a drone through that window strapped with dynamite and killing all of us? Nothing. And they all just like, they all made excuses. They're like, oh, that can happen. Blah, blah. But it turns out, nope. No one had any protection against that. No one thought about it. They could just, anyone could have done that. And so the lesson to learn from this, so by the way, they do have anti-drone defenses now. That's why I'm saying that's not a problem anymore. So that, that, that government now has anti-drone defenses. So this is no longer a threat. Um, it's still a threat, but like, you know, they're aware of it. It was like five or 10 years ago. The, one of my fundamental parts of my model about AI danger is that the world is unstable. The world currently is extremely not unstable, that's actually the wrong word, it's fragile. It's actually very resistant to small or medium shocks. It is not at all resistant against big shocks. So I don't think we've actually seen a big shock since World War II. And even World War II is like a, you know, it's, it's a big one, but it's not the biggest that you could imagine. Like there have been bigger ones in history, such as like the Black Death or something, which I would consider like an even bigger shock than World War II. Um, but since then, I, I don't think the world has actually seen a truly big shock. Like even like the 2008 financial crisis is like a medium at most, you know, it's like, sure. It was, and like COVID also like medium. It's like, you know, and like an historical, if you look at like historical context, 2000 years context, like, you know, COVID was like, you know, it wasn't as bad as the Spanish flu. You know, it wasn't as bad as Black Death. You know, like, you know, we've had bigger ones that humanity got through just fine. So the world, I think, is fundamentally fragile in that we, humans generally build defenses against like, it's again the black swan thing. They trade volatility for blow up risks. You know, so we'll couch things enough that, you know, n- from day to day, mostly everything's fine. You know, day to day, volatility gets evened out, no problem. Year to year, it mostly gets, you know, okay, you know, some war down in Africa happens, you know, some terrorism over in the Middle East, you know, but like, you know, for the most part, if you live in the Western world or like, you know, in Tokyo or something, you're fine. You don't notice it. We don't buffer well against, you know, decade or century level events. And an example of that is, you know, after COVID hit and it gave us a warning shot, as far as I'm concerned, is what a you know, really bad pandemic could look like, like a Black Death level pandemic could look like. Governments are now cutting back on their pandemic spending and striking down all bills to increase for future events. Hmm. Suspicious. So the world is very unstable. I think it is at the point where... A lot of, I, I was talking to a senior uh, um, official at a government who also has a lot of connection to security services and such. And um, 
we were talking about this and like, you know, what holds the world together? Like, why don't people do all these crazy attacks we were coming up with? Uh, is it simply because people are too nice or too good? And most people are either nice or good or incapable. And so we're relying on the vast majority of people simply not attempting uh, these uh, horrific yeah. event, horrific you actions. You got yet. it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's a goodness, a goodness. It's just like most people don't actually want to hurt other people, like not really, or at least not randomly. You know, like most people want society to be stable. Most people want other people to be he healthy and happy. Like, you know, so maybe you'll hate like one guy. And you'll be like, fuck this guy. I want to kill this guy. But like, it's very rare for people to like actually want to kill many people or like actually or like harm or maim many people. It's actually rare. It, it, it definitely exists, but it's like quite rare. And there's the other. And then, then another one is agency, intelligence, optimization. We're actually well, pretty well protected against people who want to maim and torture. They're not smart. They land in prison. You know, like low IQ sociopaths. And like, there's this meme of this, like, you know, sociopaths are these suave, intelligent, you know, manipulative, you know, vampires. No, those are just the only ones you see. Most of them just land in fucking prison and you never see them again because they're just complete psychos. You know, they, like, you know, start torturing animals as kids, you know, start beating women by the time they're 14, you know, you know, start, you know, robbing people by the age they're, they're, you know, they're eight or whatever. Like, it's, it's like, it, if you want to really see the dark world as it exists, you should look up like juvenile sociopathy or psycho psychopathy. It's like actually shocking. And so I think, I think a lot of people who don't work in law enforcement aren't, or like psychiatry aren't aware of is just how bad it is. Like how there are some people who are just so incorrigibly evil, like truly incorrigibly evil, that there's just nothing you can do but just like throw them in a cage and just leave, leave them there because they just cannot rehabilitate. This is again rare. Like this is not like these is like a small percentage of the population, but they do exist. And like ignoring that these people exist is, I think, actually very dangerous because it gives you an inaccurate model about how reality works. And so the point here would be that AIs would be different because AIs would be capable and perhaps, or uh, they they perhaps would not share our human um, reluctance to hurt other people. Exactly. Imagine just hypothetically, you have a system, an AI system. No, it's not, it's not really smarter than the human stuff. No super intelligence. Doesn't even have to human level intelligence. Not even human level, you know? It's not that smart. It, but it's like pretty smart, you know? It can like, you know, it's like, you know, 90 IQ, 100 IQ. You can do some thinking, you can do some planning. But also it's read every book ever written. It has perfect memory. It can be run, you know, at, you know, superhuman speeds and many copies in parallel. And you give this into the hands. You know, maybe this thing can't do planning very well yet, or it has like some problems or whatever right but then you just give it to a human or a group of humans and now suddenly imagine you had access to a group of perfectly loyal you know they never snitch they never get tired they never break they never turn you know sociopaths the the complete sociopath they'll do anything you want they're not evil per se ais wouldn't be evil per se they wouldn't be like you know sadistic but they would be socio sociopathic they would have no Qualms. If you said, hey, maximize my chance of becoming president, and they calculate, ooh, assassinating him is a good idea, well, they wouldn't. Why would the AI hesitate? It's just optimizing a goal function. So when humans think about optimizing for goals, it's extremely implicit that we have these constraints, that we don't even, there's like taboo areas. Like if you want to become president, you wouldn't even think of killing the president because you'd be like, no, I'd never do that. You could also argue on consequentialist grounds that like, oh, it wouldn't work or you'd get in trouble, blah, blah, blah. But to a certain, to a large degree, also, you just wouldn't do that. Like, I would just not do that. I like, I like purely like deontologically, I would just not do that. But if you have a system that's only optimizing, well, so the danger I see from AI in the short term is not, you know, super intelligence or anything or like, you know, emergent things. Those might also happen. Like this is, those are strictly worse scenarios than the scenario I'm describing. The scenario I'm describing is the, the least worst scenario that still ruins everything. But what I'm thinking about is systems that are perfect sociopaths that are just optimizing. There's a great post on Lestron called Optimality is the Tiger and Agents are its Teeth, which is related to this as well, where you, these can be systems that are not agents. It's not necessarily that systems are agents. It's not necessarily that they're, you know, interacting with the world or whatever. These can just be like very simple AI systems 
they're just very intelligent, right? And they're just, but they're just optimizing for something. And to optimize for something, they might just cold-heartedly conclude, ooh, well, I've simulated how to you know, kill the president. First, run this piece of code and, uh, with an internet-connected device. Or, you know, and then that spawns some kind of agent. You know, or or you know, some kind of agentic process that you know do, does some kind of actions in the environment that are like necessary to assassinate the president or whatever. So in the short term, you're mostly worried about these tool AI systems, such as, for example, uh, GPT three would be an example of this, used by humans with uh, with goals that that conflict with those of broader society. So say, for example, we want to no. It's worse than that. Okay, <laughs> that's 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 still one of the positive scenarios. There are even worse scenarios than that. It's even worse. So like, that is a scenario. It's a minimum viable thing. Like this is the one most people agree with. I'm like, hey, imagine you have like you know some intelligence service or whatever from a hostile nation, and they have access to a group of never you know never sleeping sociopaths. They'll be like, oh shit. So this is the existence proof that the world is unstable. Like every single person I've talked to from intelligence services or like security, if I told them, hey. Imagine your adversary had 100 perfectly loyal sociopaths that would do everything and are also as smart as von Neumann. How would you defend against that? They would be like, we're fucked. Like, like that, like, there is no defense against that. That is like insane. So this is the existence proof that the world is unstable. Now, things get even worse. So I don't even think you need a human in the loop. Like, I, my default outcome scenario doesn't even involve a human doing this. This is like, if we get to this scenario, we're already in one of the better timelines. My mainline prediction is, is that we should die before we get to the scenario. What's going to happen is instead, as we build systems that, you know, continue to increase intelligence and generality, we have them, you know, training themselves or in the environment or whatever, gathering new data from the internet, playing in video games, simulation, whatever, right? You know. DeepMind just released that paper of like an agent that teaches itself how to like, you know, collect diamonds in Minecraft and whatnot, you know, that kind of stuff. And we just, you know, just scale it up, scale it up. Oh, suddenly it has art and language and no, doesn't use hand axes anymore. And suddenly, I don't know, something weird happens. So my prediction is, so my true prediction, which is more sh higher shock level, which is like, you know, might make sense to you or the audience, but you know, it doesn't work as well on like, you know, government officials is then like, and then something weird happens. We have these systems that no one intended them to do anything. You know, intelligence didn't intend for humans to develop culture or to didn't intend for people to develop any certain ideology or preferences or opinions or whatever. But as they become more powerful, they're interacting with their environment, they're, you know, have these like discontinuous capability gains and like, you know, like those, you know, sums of S curves or whatever. So like, to be clear, I think all of this will look completely smooth from the perspective of loss. So if you look at like the loss graphs of these things, I think there will be no anomalies. I do not predict any anomalies. I think things will go totally smoothly as predicted, you know, and then at some point, you know, so, you know, the difference between like, you know, GPT-4 and GPT-3 on loss is like not that massive, you know, but it could do a, bunch of crazy new things that like GPT-3 can't do. I think that's just going to keep happening. And then people are going to start using them for benign tasks. You know, people are going to start automating, you know, writing assistants, um, you know, just like you know, clerical work and, you know, stuff for coding, you know, stuff like that, like all this benign stuff. And I think this is all going to be completely benign until it very suddenly isn't. And then very suddenly we have these systems that start taking actions and we don't really know why or what they're doing but it's like we're like ah, it's fine use some rlhf you know just kind of like you know it's fine and what the term you just used what does that mean oh sorry uh reinforcement learning from human feedback this is a uh, commonly used technique at the moment which i have strong technical disagreements with um basically the idea is you take like language models or systems like this and you train them to optimize a model of what humans would like. So you have like humans look at various outputs of the model and rate them, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down. And you make the model like output the thumbs up ones more and the thumbs down ones ones less, sort of. And this is sometimes touted as an alignment technique. I do not think that is a very fair description of what the technique actually does. Because the, the problem here is that you, you don't really know which goals you're encoding in the agent. You don't know how the agent is or how the AI model is understanding your thumbs down or thumbs up. 
Exactly. So like this is encoding human preferences in the ontology of weight diffs, which is just such an alien way. Like, okay, I show you a 175 billion you know, list of numbers of like slightly changing floating point numbers. And I'm saying like, okay, cool. This is your preferences here encoded, super legible. Well, no, like, of course not. Like, what, what the hell am I supposed to do with this? This is an ontology I understand. Why would you expect your ontology to fit into this? Like, there's like some alien comes down from Earth and he, uh, comes down from the space and he's like, ah, I've been looking at you guys. You guys really like Frolarbo, don't you? And you're like, what the fuck is Frolarbo? Like, yeah, I got you guys. And then he goes off to do whatever that is. That's kind of like how RLHF is. It's like- So you, you, you can't understand what you've encoded by looking yes. at the weights of, of the network. And that's, no, it, that's yeah, a, it, the, the, there's a research paradigm trying to, to interpret uh, these weights and, and trying to extract what information is encoded. But that's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely lagging behind progress in the models themselves. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we there's a there's a fun little experiment we did a conjecture where we looked at two different models that were trained slightly differently. So this is not actually RLHF. We thought it was RLHF. Turns out it wasn't. At least assuming OpenAI is telling the truth, which you know we don't know. Um, basically, we saw two models, so two GPT models, and one of the models, if you asked it for a random number. And you looked at the you know its output probability over like digits, it was like pretty random actually, not perfect. Like forty two was like slightly more likely than others, but um, overall it was like pretty smooth uh, distribution. But then if you look at this other model, this instruct model, and you asked it for a random number, it would put like almost all its probability mass onto like two numbers. It was like it had like two favorite numbers. So this is really interesting. So what I interpret kind of is going on here. I don't think OpenAI like tried to tell the model to like these numbers. No, I, I I don't think that's what happened at all. But I expect what happened is it's just they you know we're training on just like you know you know being useful to humans, just showing a bunch of examples, whatever. And for some reason, something about you know the thumbs up things had some weird correlations or some weird connections somewhere something that for some reason you know just made it really like these numbers, just like really upvote these numbers. This was not intentional. So the interesting thing here is not, oh, it has bigger numbers. That's like, you know, kind of funny, you know? It's kind of harmless. And like, this has been solved in newer models. Like they have much more data now and like they don't have this problem anymore. So, you know, it's more of an interesting anecdote. The interesting thing here is not the exact example. It's that like, what else are they encoding? <laughs> you know, what else are in those weight updates? Who knows? We don't know. It's an example of how seemingly random goals could arise in an AI model, and suddenly, exactly. uh, suddenly the the model starts acting uh, in in a way that to us look looks weird. Um, but it's because we've encoded some goals that we don't understand, and and then the the AI safety problem, the alignment problem, the control problem is then when these goals begin diverging from the goals of humanity or from the goals of the lab or company developing the AI, that is where things go off the rails. Um, the way we've been talking about it here <laughs> and the, the framing of the fragile world, I think, uh, I think it's, a, it's a great way to frame it because it, it underlines how, how serious this problem is and perhaps how uh, intractable it is. Do you, do you think AI safety can be, can be solved by, by humanity, uh, given the fact that we have, we have a, a mixed record of containing uh, dangerous technologies? We've we have extremely strict standards for uh, nuclear uh, energy uh, production and for uh, biological laboratories, and still there are accidents. There are uh, these these have happened. So, if 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 the failure rate uh, or if the security has to be extremely high and and the failure rate extremely low for this to succeed, can we succeed? Can of course. There's no law of physics that forbids us from solving the problem building a super, an aligned super intelligence and having a wonderful future. There was nothing whatsoever that forbids this from happening. This is completely allowed to happen by physics. This is a path that is open to us. This is a, and we have to be clear about this. This is a path that is open. We have not, it's quite interesting. We live in a timeline where we have not yet obviously lost. We're not in a timeline where like everything's out of control, you know, AIs are already spinning up and like taking over governments, like, you know, or like, you know, 
you know, weird sociopaths are in power or whatever. That's not the case. The paths are clearly still open. We can still win. But we have to be realistic here. The truth of the matter is, I don't expect us to solve it. No. I don't expect us to raise, raise, rise to the challenge. In most timelines, I expect us to fail. This is a type of problem that humanity is especially bad at solving. This is a, like, it's like, I sometimes call it like level two epistemology problem. This is a problem that is not like a normal scientific problem where we're like can iterate over and over and like failure isn't catastrophic. And, you know, it's not a problem if we can like, you know, if we don't have, you know, we don't get everything right on the first try. People are like mostly aligned on the same, on the same page and whatever. That's not where we're at. It's not where we're at at all. This is a much, much, much harder problem. This is a problem where if we, if we get it wrong on the critical first try, that's it. No iteration. We might be able to iterate on like proto versions of it, right? But like, we're this is less like the nuclear bomb and more like the nuclear bomb if it, had it, if it would ignite the atmosphere. And you know, there there was the thing in in Los Alamos where they weren't sure if it was going to ignite the atmosphere. There was like a possibility that it could ignite the whole atmosphere, and they did like some crazy te- like mathematics like three days before the test, and it still gave them like a thirty percent chance it might ignite the the atmosphere. And they still did it. Like, imagine, imagine being in that room and being like, well, all right, it's only 30% that we will kill everyone forever. But I mean, the general sure is shouting, so let's do it anyways. Like, this is the state of mankind. Like, like imagine, imagine being at the state where you can both believe that that is 30% chance of the world, you know, ending. But the scary alpha ape is yelling at me, so I should do it. Like, that's, that's the state of mankind. Or perhaps you are uh, too curious not to do it. That, that yeah, will be even more, even more sinister in, in, in some sense. It uh, is. I think for a lot of scientists, that was the case. The case. Yeah. I think for a lot of them. So there's this truly darkly funny quote. I don't remember exactly, but it's from von Neumann, where he's like, uh, you know, the, the goal of science, you know, for scientists is to do science, no matter the consequences. It doesn't matter if it causes harm. It must be done because, you know, we must do it. And I'm like, what? Like, like, so <laughs> in my personal life, one of the mantras I live my life by, one of the things I like to repeat my, to myself to like orient myself through life is the, sa- is the, the saying, don't be stupid. <laughs> now, this is a very different saying from be smart. Because be smart is hard. I can't guarantee I'm smart. So dear listener, I cannot guarantee to you that any of the things I'm saying is smart. I can't guarantee you that. I can't guarantee that I won't I'll be smart in all scenarios. But I'm pretty but like I'm pretty good at not being stupid. Not I'm not perfect at it. I still I'm still stupid sometimes. But like if you actually orient yourself around recognizing when you're being stupid and just not doing that, you can already outperform like everyone by like a crazy margin. Because most people do stupid things all the time it's crazy how much time people spend just like loading their guns and shooting themselves in, into the foot in, over and over again like and the same goes for humanity on a civilizational level you think yep absolutely if humanity would literally just shooting stop shooting itself in the foot i'm not even saying you know you know and you know become enlightened and ascend into the you know a truly you know beautiful society which by the way is also possible Everyone's just being stupid. But even if we would just not be stupid and not shoot ourselves in the foot over and 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 over over again, if we could just do that, man, (laughs) man, would I feel better about the future? But like prediction markets are still illegal in the US. Like we are shooting ourselves in the foot so hard every single day, all the time. It's in. It's just truly maddening. Like if an alien came down from space, to be like, "Oh, what the fuck did you guys do?" What would it mean for humanity to not be stupid uh, in terms of AI safety? What should we do? What is what is the scenario? What is a? How do we survive this if if we were to not be stupid? Uh, so that's a great question. So I'm gonna I, I'm, I'm gonna give an answer for what would we do if we were not stupid, and what would we do if we were smart? That's what I want to hear. Yeah. So first answer: What would we do if we're not stupid? Everyone would just kind of look at each other and like, huh, this AGI thing, you know, seems like could it connect the, the atmosphere, huh, guys? Yep. We should probably not do it, right? Yep. And so they didn't. 
<laughs> that would be the non-stupid version. Like, you know, back to Alan Turing, people have predicted this. Like, this is not like some crazy new thing or whatever. It's like, it's obviously predictable. Alan Turing already predicted all of this, basically. And like, you know, I, I like, you know, IG good and stuff like this. So Let, let's, pause, let's, sorry, but let's pause here for a second, actually. Do you think it's possible to slow down uh, progress in AI capabilities research? So possible? Could, 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 yeah <laughs> do you think it's it's likely that we will coordinate do you think it's it's uh won't we just uh, hand off the 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 torch to less uh, scrupulous uh, companies or labs uh if if say say open mind uh, sorry uh deep mind and open ai began collaborating on slowing down uh progress in their research yeah wouldn't it just be then the next uh, most uh you know advanced company taking the lead so the, the original question you asked me is, what will we do if humanity will stop being stupid? <clears throat> so you're now asking, okay, what happens if we continue to be stupid? Because obviously, if we were not stupid, the other labs would just also not do it. So those are two different questions. Just want to make that clear. Um, so you're asking, okay, what do we do if we continue to be stupid? Um, I can answer that question. I have many models here. Um, I expect us to be, continue to be stupid, to be clear. And so, so assume we continue to be stupid. Um, then like... So there's, there's, two, there's two parts to this, I guess. Two main parts I, 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 I'll put into this. First part is, will others catch up? How much will they catch up, et cetera, et cetera? Second, does this question even make sense? First answer. I actually genuinely think that no one other than like the like top labs are relevant. I don't think China's relevant at all. Like I, don't, I, I think it's a terrible meme. They're not going to catch up. They're so far behind. Who cares? Like I think this is actually genuinely a terrible meme. This is like a real, like, like insidious, insidiously bad meme is that, so it's relevant for longer timelines. If we're dealing with longer timelines, I mean, I recommend everyone just, you know, start solving politics because, oh no. Um, if we're in short timelines, it doesn't matter. Like, like, well, politics matters to be clear, but like China, Russia, whatever, like Russia obviously doesn't matter. They obviously don't have the capabilities. And like, people have these like really weird, like, orientalist like mindset around china like this like boogeyman that has like all this capability but, like if you actually look at china like actually like really look at it and like how science is done there and like the bureaucracy and like whatever china's like one of the worst places in the world to do science like they're like doing science in china is a nightmare it's so bureaucratic it's so slow it's so you know ideology you know suffuses every part of it they're like so much of it is marketing, like just like the Chinese government markets itself as good at science, super, super hard. And they have a whole large population, which includes lots of brilliant people who are succeeding despite the Chinese government. Like, to be clear, a lot of the smartest people in the world are Chinese. Like, there's a lot of truly brilliant Chinese people. And, you know, they succeed despite the Chinese government, not thanks to it. You know, it's just because of their, you know, the perseverance of the human soul and mind. These people can do great work. And I would never, and most of those go to the US do their good work. Because, you know, if you're a smart, brilliant Chinese person, you know, student or whatever, why would you want to stay there with all this bureaucracy and politics and all this bullshit? You know, if you go to the US, you make tons of money and you can do your research much better. So, so if we can, if we can rule China out as, as taking the lead, if, if, the, if the US were to begin not advancing AI capabilities, what about just the, uh, uh, say the the second tier of of American AI companies, say perhaps a, a Facebook or a Google Brain or so, something like this. Yeah. So there are several factors that go into that. Uh, one is is that they don't actually want to kill everybody. <laughs> like like, and they are mostly you know like not insane. Like they might be like not super convinced, and they might be like normal amounts of irrational, but they're not like politics amount of irrational so like you can talk to them like you can just talk to mark zuckerberg like he is weird and whatever but like he is a person you can talk to and also these are all people who do listen to the u.s government you know if the u.s government said no more agi there would be none of course, that's not what would actually happen. My actual models are more that government takes over and starts ruining everything because governments aren't capable enough to do this like actual non-stupid things. So this brings us back to not being stupid. So in the real world, this is not impossible. Governments have levers 
to do this. It is a thing that is like within their like jurisdiction and like power, but it is not within their executive ability, I think, to at least not on short timelines, or at least not effectively. I hope I'm wrong about this, and this is something we can like figure out. So actually, it's worse than that. I'm actually very skeptical about governments trying to slow down AGI. Uh, I think this is not a good idea. And, or, well, it's tricky. Be- and, but the reason I think this is because of my model of governments and how incompetent and, like, contra- and like you know, internally inconsistent they are. In a sense, having labs in control is not ideal, but it is, there are more concentrated points of coordination. It's easier to coordinate with DeepMind than it is with the U.S. government. And whether if we have longer timelines in five years, even maybe on the five-year timeline, it's not going to matter because governments are going to get involved. Obviously, like obviously, so there's no way, you know, like intelligence services are just going to let this shit go on if like if we have like you know ten-year timelines or twenty-year timelines. No way, intelligence services are. I mean, I'm pretty sure all these organizations are already infiltrated by intelligence agencies. I would be surprised if intelligence agencies were listening to us right now. I've been cited in the CIA paper. Did you know that? <laughs> I didn't know that. I have. Yes. Um, so, mm, that's probably fine, right? <laughs> but yeah. So one thing that government, especially the US government, is very good at is reacting to national threats. That is like the only thing that makes the US government get its shit together is when the Pentagon says this needs to get done. Then the US government can actually do things. So. If this continues to, you know, babble along as like a like futurist nerd kind of maybe economics thing, then I don't expect governments to do much. If this becomes like a national threat type scenario, then I expect the behemoth to lumber into action, and I expect it to break everything by default, unless we, you know, somehow direct this and like you know help the behemoth make a non-stupid choice. I don't think you can make a smart choice. I, I think it's like genuinely possible for like governments to be smart. I think it's just like too complicated. But I think it's possible to make governments be not stupid. And would, would that be by a piece of legislation uh, governing how, uh, how, they, how the governments would govern AI? Or what are you thinking in terms of helping governments not be stupid? The truth is, is that the government is composed of people. It's composed of, you know, lots of civil servants and politicians and bureaucrats and uh, generals and, you know, intelligence service agents and so on. These are all people. And these are all people you can talk to. These are all, I've been surprised by how much I have, like, you know, just, like, contacted some, like, senior government officials and they were quite happy to talk to me. And I could just answer their questions. And that was quite nice. And I'd like to do more of this. I have, this is a thing I've updated very heavily on over the last year is how much again make, trying to make these people act smartly in the scenario at scale maybe individuals like i've met some pretty smart people in government actually um some not i met some pretty pretty smart people you can't do that at scale but you can help people be not stupid because it's also in their interest to not be stupid so i think the things for example that i am doing and that would be very interesting if any of your readers out, uh, listeners out there are, you know, working government, intelligence services, whatever, and you're trying to understand these problems better and how to do this, my email is open. Please let me know. I would be happy to help. I think this is important to like inform people, like, you know, have, give people better models of these kinds of things, how we can reason about kind of things. I don't think there'll be like one piece of legislation that fixes all of this or whatever. I think the way government really works is like, not like that. Like it's a lot more backroom deals, dinners, you know, who knows who, who owes who a favor, you know, what are the lines of, you know, various parties and whatever. And I think the ideal thing I would want is that just to have everyone kind of be on the, on the not stupid side, just be like, yeah, let's, let's like not be stupid about this. Let's like all take this seriously. Let's like fund alignment research, like Jesus Christ, please. Like, let's just like have DARPA pull you know, push $10 billion into a li- into alignment research. Why not? Like, this is like for a government. This is like, you know, they can, they can make this happen. Like, the number of people that need to sign off to get like $100 million onto like a, onto like a project is like shockingly low. It's like, it's like 
depending on the government, it could be like two people. So let's just do that. Like there's like 200 people maybe in the whole world working full time on alignment. If governments just like said, even just said, this is a national priority, even if they don't like put funds into anything, basically all like massive amounts of academia will just like lumber into motion and because it becomes high status. Now it becomes the thing to be working on. It becomes a legitimate real scientific problem, you know, like, you know, rubber stamped, you know, this is a, you know, you are a high status person for working on this. Cool. And just that would cause, I think, a massive shift in like how many people take this problem seriously and like how academics are taking this problem seriously. There is a massive risk in doing all these things because whenever you get lots of people involved, you know, politics gets important. So ideal world would be, of course, you know, oh, it turns out alignment is super easy and we just solved it in our basement and here it is and everyone's happy. I don't expect that's how things are going to go. So if we're realistic, if you do some real real politics here, then what we need to do is to be realistic that people will get interested. This is of interest to everyone. This is of interest to governments, intelligence agencies, academics, everyone. Let's help people not be stupid. Let's talk to them. Let's be friendly. You know? Let's say that uh, DARPA f- began funding alignment research uh, to the tune of, of $100 million uh, or whatever. you we, we, Pick your number. Um, and... You know, could this be counterproductive because the money would be used to increase capabilities? Isn't that, oh, yeah, isn't that a, a, a pretty uh, live danger? Um, if we look at, for example, critics of, of OpenAI will tell a story in which OpenAI was founded with safety in mind, but then increased capabilities uh, of, of, of AI and thereby uh, increased AI risk. And perhaps the same thing could happen with uh, a government grant uh, into alignment research. Of course, this is the default thing that happens. Everyone's stupid, remember. Like, (laughs) being smart would be just the government nationalizes everything, creates the Alignment Manhattan Project, solves the problem, we're done. That's the smart solution. We're never going to get that. That is like, don't even think about that. It's not possible. Yeah, so it's not, it's, not, it's not that interesting, interesting to discuss what we would do in, an, in a very smart world. So what we're yes. trying to avoid <laughs> being stupid instead. Yes, we're trying to... Okay, so, like, so I'm, I'm thinking about like Pareto improvements here. I'm thinking think about not stupid. We are currently in a world where there is no government funding for alignment. This is stupid. Like, it's not just like not smart. It's also stupid. If we had like, okay, $10 billion alignment research and it all goes to, you know, something irrelevant or something dangerous i'm like okay that's not good but this is a less stupid world and i expect a world that is already at this point will be more amenable to interventions that help safety and alignment than the ones we're currently in of course because it's backfire yes obviously like anything involving you know lumbering behemoths you know tends to involve you know um blowback risk you know when you when a giant monster is attacking Tokyo and you summon Godzilla, like you know, Godzilla could probably beat the monster, but there's going to be a lot of reconstruction costs, you know, by default. Even if Godzilla is the good guy. So how could government go, uh, intervention go wrong here? What, what are ways in which uh, the U.S. government could break things? Oh man, oh god, do I even want to give them ideas? I mean, I mean plenty of, of things. I mean, obviously, as you just said, the obvious one is just you know funding capabilities work, obviously. Um, the second one, which I think is just extremely likely to happen, is just they only fund military applications. If they don't actually fund safety. They just fund like, okay, how do we maximize, you know, military applications and whatever? And that obviously kills you. Um, another one, like I actually talked to someone about this a while back. He said something very interesting. So um, I was talking about interpretability research with them, which is, you know, a very common topic in AI alignment research. And he basically said, um, that so he worked for the uh you know, military industrial complex and he said that the number one thing currently holding military back from deploying ais at wide scale is lack of interpretability and accountability so every increase in interpretability increases the military adoption of ai this is i think something that a lot of people in like the AI safety world do not consider when they consider the cost benefit analysis of interpretability research i do I still think it's worth it, but it is something that you should have in your calculus. So these are like some obvious ways that the government can mess it up. Another obvious way they can mess it up is to politicize it. It becomes a left-wing, right-wing, you know, red-blue team issue. 
that seems that's another way things could be stupid like the non-stupid thing is well obviously this is not red or blue this is like you know we're, we're all it's all in all of our interest to you know be able to control our technology like no one benefits from this not be the case. So, you know, let's just not be stupid about that. Unfortunately, this is the kind of thing humans tend to be really stupid about, you know, like, like you know, climate change or whatever. Yeah, let's, let's go back to the question of government grants for AI alignment research. Uh, another thing that could go wrong here is that AI alignment research becomes a buzzword uh, and it, becomes, it, it comes to mean uh, something else than, than what it originally meant. And it becomes a way to attract funding to your to your existing pro, uh, projects and so on. Is there a way to to avoid this? Is there a way to be strict about what you're what you're trying to fund um, without it drifting into becoming too broad and uh, coming to mean something else? No, nah, that would involve being smart. <laughs> Is there any hope here for 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 what could we do to to constrain what we are trying to fund? Oh, there, I mean, there's lots of marginal things you can do here. But actually, I think this is a massive mistake that a lot of funders have been making here. Is that, um, so this is a, actually a genuine critique I have of like EA and like, you know, AI safety funding, is they're extremely risk averse. Like they build themselves as like, oh, you know, we're funding the crazy stuff no one else is funding, or like, you know, we're risk willing to do things, or whatever. But they're not actually. Like DARPA is way less risk averse than like, you know, OpenFill. Or, or whatever, right? Understandable also because DARPA has way more money. So like, you know, this is not, a, this is like an understandable thing that, you know, maybe OpenFill would be more conservative because they have much less resources and, you know, DARPA, you know, can do all kinds of crazy things. But like, I would expect that, so like when DARPA funds things, like they fund a lot of crazy, stupid bullshit. And like they, and but like OpenFill funds like, you know, one person that turns out to be controversial or like does something stupid or whatever and then people are like hmm you're using my donated money to fund this guy like that seems like an inappropriate use of blah, blah, blah. like like no good deed goes unpunished like if darpa funds some guy making an invisibility cloak or whatever right you know it's darpa you know whatever they, they do weird mil tech stuff that doesn't work but if a philanthropic organization, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funds like one company that turns out to be shady or whatever, everyone's of course immediately on their case. No good deed goes unpunished. It's really funny how if you were a rich billionaire and you're just selfish, you don't really get criticized for that very much. It's kind of like you're like, yeah, yeah obviously, but it's like the it's called the Copenhagen interpretation of ethics. If you're a billionaire and you try to solve a problem that everyone and you fail to solve the problem, you get way more shit than all the billionaires that did nothing. This is, a, this is, again, humanity shooting themselves in the foot so abysmally hard. Like you should get credit for trying to solve a problem even if you fail, but the exact opposite happens. This is a large reason of why people are so low agentic is because trying and failing is, gives you more social negative than not even trying. So this is a massive problem. And so when I think about government grants, yeah, I expect most of it to go to bullshit. And I expect most of it not going to work. But, you know, and, and to be clear, if I wanted government grants, the way I would want it to go is DARPA type. DARPA is very different from like how like other grant making works. If we do the other grant making, also fine. But I also think there's ways that would help. But ideal case would be like DARPA, like high risk, like weirdness. Because we don't know how to solve alignment. Alignment is not like a low risk, like, man, we just need this amount of money to build the alignment machine and then we're fine. No, no, no. This is blue sky research. Like there's like, you know, we, if you look at like, you know, current alignment approaches, you know, some are like pretty simple and reasonable. Others involve like, you know, retro causal, a, you know, a causal decision, theoretic, multiversal, you know, decision theory simulations or whatever. Right. And you're like, is either like, is either of these going to work? I don't know, probably not, but sure as hell, someone should fund them. Like, someone should try. Is there a way to earn money by solving alignment? I mean, uh, depending on what you mean by that, obviously, yes. I mean, in the sense that if you solve alignment, you make infinite money, obviously. Like, you solved everything. Like, 
the, the thing holding back humanity's progress, or the thing, the limiting factor, the bottleneck on human economic progress, well, it's not the only bottleneck, but the biggest bottleneck is intelligence, is that if everyone was just twice as smart, oh man, could you imagine? Could you imagine if just like the, the median human had like 200 IQ? Could you imagine what society would be like? Oh, the policies, the efficiency, all oh, the science, the you know the you know, the social like systems we could build, the you know, the coordination technology we could implement. Like, oh, could you imagine? And this is just like a modest increase of intelligence. You know, this is like if every you know, you know, if everyone was like, this is still like human range. Like, like two hundred IQ is like still within human range. Like, there are people that are that smart. You know, so like that's still like not as as good like anywhere near as good as things could be if we have like you know ai or like you know, super intelligence that is like you know running things and developing technology and coordinating and you know doing economic activity and whatnot we could have you know everything like you know if you have an agi and it does what you want it to do i mean christ just tell it to cure cancer tell it to you know trade infinite money in the stock market tell it to just no more wars please just like go negotiate with everybody and solve all politics yeah, I was, I was simply interested in, in what the best funding model for solving this problem is, whether it's, it's nonprofit or government grants or whether it could be a for-profit company or some new uh, legal construction uh, like a limited profit uh, open AI style. Great question. Uh, this is a thing I, I've often obviously thought about a lot. And so, I mean, if we were a smart society, we would have, you know, like, you know, impact grants. What is an uh, impact grant? So. Um, I don't know exactly all the exact details that you'll do this or whatever, but this is a new funding instrument where basically you can like, you sell impact certificates. I think that's what it's called. Actually, maybe I'm thinking of impact markets, not grants. One or the other. And like, basically you're creating a new charity. It will work the following way. It involves the following people. And now you sell shares in the impact. You say like, you know, I'm share, spilling a, selling a hundred shares or a million shares. They're like the, philanthropic benefit of this existing. So then people who think this is good and this should exist can buy the shares to fund your operation. So like this would be an example of like something that a smart society would have. It would have like, this would be like super common. And then the, the price of these certificates rise when there's more impact from the, from the company uh, whose shares we're talking about. Yeah, that's, yeah. And then you can also do more. Like, like there's, this is just an example of like a, a simple system that like, again, showing just like how Humans are, you know, so far away from like smarter societies would have even better systems, like even better, like a common funding, you know, cratic funding and like, you know, common, you know, goods funding kind of research. And let's just take one objection to impact grants, uh, which is to uh, question whether we can measure uh, impact uh, appropriately for, for these grants to work and, and objectively in a sense. So we can so this is information that's, that's out there objectively that, that we can trade on. Uh, do you think that's possible? Or do you think that's likely to happen? In a, in a smart society, of course that's possible, but we're not in a smart society. So like, this is an example of a technology that only works in a smart society. It doesn't work in ours. I don't think impact markets work in our society. They just don't. Um, they, it's not that they fundamentally can't work. They just don't work for practical contingent reasons that could be overcome in the future, but in the way things currently are, no, 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 they just don't work. So would you actually want to be pragmatic about funds? And this is like, you know, so for listeners who don't know, I run an AI alignment research company, Conjecture, and we are a for-profit company. And that's not a coincidence. The reasoning for that is quite simply that that is the best form, I think, currently to be able to raise large amounts of money and to be able to have an ongoing supply of money to fund research and do this kind of stuff. If you don't have like some you know, kind of crazy billionaire backing or something, um, even there, there's problems like, you know, diversification and stuff. The truth is that if you look at how our society allocates resources, money, power, et cetera, the currently, again, this is a contingent truth. This is not a ideological statement. This is just a contingent truth about how reality currently is set up, but this could like change in five years, is that currently the vehicle through which it is most likely to go from $0 to a billion dollars in a short period of time is a startup. This is a contingent truth about how our markets are currently set up, you know, 50 years ago, that was not true, you know, and maybe five years from now, that won't be true. But currently, VC markets are startups that are built, you know, software-based products 
that you know are useful, you know, scale very, very quickly to very, very many users are the most effective way to gain very, very large amounts of resources very quickly. This, you know, unless you happen to have some kind of weird other scenario, but like those aren't scalable for the most part. Because also our markets are way more robust and way more diversified sources of funding and so on than, for example, having one billionaire be your patron. That might, you know, might be great. And, you know, if some billionaire wants to come by and, you know, hand us a billion dollars, happy to talk. But um, practically, you know, as we saw, for example, with the FTX scenario, um, there are blow up risks, let's say. Yeah, and so perhaps the main objection to the for-profit model is that uh, the incentives won't be uh, properly aligned uh, to to do the the actually um, societally societally beneficial thing. Uh, you will be uh, pushed into uh, doing the profitable thing as opposed to the uh, to the good thing. Yeah, but that's not a property of for profits. That's a property of how we as society assign credit. If we had impact markets. If we had, you know, benevolent, you know, billionaire patrons or whatever, then we would be assigning credit differently as a society. Money is fundamentally a credit assignment mechanism. It is a reinforcement mechanism. It is a mechanism that gives subparts of a computational graph ability to do more computation, to do more actions. We reward people, ideally, by, you know, credit assignment is a fundamentally hard problem. Like credit assignment is extremely, extremely hard. And it's, you know, it's massive rabbit hole there and the fundamental like pro the fundamental like you know um insight from like uh, mercantilism first and later capitalism is how we do this credit assignment there's other economic systems that do credit assignment differently and the the fundamental progress of capitalism is the idea of how we assign credit to like you know people with capital or you know labor or whatever in certain ways you can agree or disagree whether this is the right way to do this, but it has been a very efficient, it's very, it's the way our things currently work. It's the efficient, most efficient system we currently have. Now, capitalism is in many ways natural. Like, you know, you give people money for things you want. Trade is a very natural, fundamental thing to build a system or a credit assignment on top of. It's not perfect. For example, capitalism has large problems pricing externalities and like commons. This is a failure mode of capitalism. So I would expect a very advanced alien society would not be capitalist. They would definitely not be socialist, but they would be like some third thing. You know, they would have some kind of, you know, prediction market, you know, commons trading, you know, based systems, you know, some like Robin Hanson designed economy or whatever, you know. Um, and so the fact that there are these incentives are contingent, a, saint, a not stupid society would have different mechanisms. They would have different incentives. But there's a great, there's a great essay. It's like, um, I forgot who wrote it. Wrote it and it was like, uh, incentives aren't the problem you are. <laughs> it's like, if you have bad incentives and you act on them, well, you're bad. Like, you know, you did the bad thing. Like, sure, there's like some amount of exculpation here in the sense that like, you know, you can say like, well, you know, I didn't have full freedom here. There was incentives, blah, blah, blah. But ultimately you took the action, dude. Like, you know, it's true that there are systems that are so corrupt or so, you know, 1984 oppressive or whatever, you're just fucked. In that case, yeah, you're, you're fucked, obviously. Like, you know, like, what do you want me to say? Like, yeah, if you're, if you're controlled by some like crushing market force or authoritarian regime or something, and every time you try to resist, you get shot or you, you, you starve, then yeah, you just die. You just fail. Like, yeah, obviously. It's surprising that um, we have as much freedom as we do. Like people are allowed to spend their resources in weird ways. Uh, you know, people are allowed to be eccentric to a large degree, not infinitely and very differently depending on people. Like the fact Elon Musk is allowed to exist is <laughs> like, I mean, just look at the guy. Like, like you must be a pretty, you know, high IQ society to allow something like this to go on. Like, I mean, this genuinely, I mean, I'm, I'm being a bit snarky, but like, he's so weird. He's so erratic. And he like does so many like crazy things and like potentially dangerous things that like, and he, has so, but he, and he has so much power and he's still allowed to have this power. It's like, you know, in like in an authoritarian regime, this shit wouldn't fly. You know, if he was Chinese, 
that shit ain't gonna fly. You know, they're not gonna allow something like this to exist. And so, in a sense, I'm saying that this is the best we have in a stupid society. Is just like capitalist freedom. It's not perfect. It's very bad, actually. It's it's, it's quite stupid. Um, but it is the, you know, what's the alternative, right? Like, you know, the alternative is, okay, you do a nonprofit, you have no money, you die, cool, you start, game over. The alternative is you have a patron, okay? Uh, so first of all, assume you have a patron. Second, well, the patron probably got his money through capitalism. So he's using his weirdness capitalism points on you by proxy. And now you're also tied to him. So now you have the blow, blow up risk of your billionaire buddy being, you know, now he has incentives. But the incentives that the billionaire ex, you know, expresses on you are also extremely powerful. And like, you know, maybe, you know, Dustin Moskowitz or whatever is a great guy, but like, you know, there's a lot of them who are not. What do you think of uh, companies tying themselves to the mast uh, by having windfall clauses where, for example, if they successfully develop uh, AGI, they then have some clause uh, stating that they will distribute uh, the profits from this uh, venture uh, in a, say, uh, more fair way uh, after they have returned money to investors? Definitely a cute marketing stunt. But not substantially uh, important. Look, let, let me put it very simply, right? Like, you know, I, so I run a company, right? I'm CEO, you know, and whatever, right? And sure, there's like, there are things you can do. You can have like a board and you can have like shareholder meetings. You can do all these kind of things. But look, if me and my co-founders were like, hey, we're going to fuck up this company, nothing can stop you. Like, it's like, it, it, someone finds the philosopher's stone and he has a handgun you're like, what are you going to do? You can like, you can complain about, oh, no, wait, you have a contract that you said you would give me the philosopher's stone. And I'm like, okay, she too. Like, like, if, like if, if the person with a philosopher's stone and a handgun is sufficiently on the line, you're just screwed. So like, sure, you can sign these contracts and maybe that makes people feel better. But it's very funny because like if you if you ask this question to someone from like the middle ages or something they would laugh in your face they would be like what the king signed a contract with you like so what <laughs> like who's going to stop the king like and so i think it's this this thing about power is that it depends on how the situation goes of course so like there are so to, to turn down the cynical dial just a little bit from here i do think people doing this for being for a large degree actually quite genuine not all of them. Some people, this is really just safety washing. Some of them are being quite genuine. They're really trying to make things work. And I respect them for that. I think it's really nice. So I think the biggest value of these things is more in just like signaling that they tried and like they're trying. But of course, any genuine signal of honesty will quickly be co-opted by anyone who's not honest. But it's it it might be an interesting first start. It might be a a, a milestone or a symbol uh, where we 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 say that this is not some this is what we intend to do, and perhaps then the the actually trying to do that thing comes later on after you've you've uh, you've signaled that that this is what you want to do. I mean, sure, these are all coordination mechanisms of signaling. So yeah, yeah. I'm seeing from those perspectives. Yeah, it's of course it's valuable. Like you know, I like I'm. I'm being very cynical right now, you know, because also, you know, podcast mode, right? Um, but um, sig signals matter. You know, uh, signals matter, reputations matter, honor matters. Like, these things do matter. But, like, we should not, not delude ourselves here, right? That, like, people lie. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm sorry if this is shocking to any listeners, but uh, people lie, like, a lot, all the time. And they change their minds. You know, a lot of people promise very big things when good times comes but once you know war comes suddenly you know you see how people really are so i'm interested in these mechanisms from the perspective of what they say about the people like i know some of these organizations and i know like some of the thought process that went into these things and I'm like wow you really tried like that's that's like genuinely heartwarming like i actually feel better about you as a person i trust you more now there's other people where i'm like oh <laughs> yeah this is just a marketing center i do not trust you more um, so the interesting thing for me is what it says about the people or like, or what it signals about the people and also what it doesn't signal about people. I'm not 
optimistic about the legal mechanisms. Like, I, I just, like, I would love if they would work. Like, it, but the problem is legal mechanisms like these involve having enforcement power. And like, if you have AGI, uh, yeah, who's going to enforce that exactly? Mm -hmm. Point taken. All right, perfect. Let's let's end it here and then perhaps move into the to the uh, semi or pseudo lightning round, as I as I call it.